Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have back with us in the studio, Mark Headley. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Mark, you are the man of the hour. You were out at Gold Base with a Danish TV film crew and it made international news. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. What happened? Well, I got contacted by a, a Danish documentary team and really what they were looking for is somebody who knew a lot about the ant base and what all the different buildings and stuff were. Like I told Tony Ortega uh, of the underground bunker, I was I was a glorified tour guide. I mean, that's really what, what, why I was there. They just wanted to you know, know which, which buildings were which. They had another gentleman there from Denmark who was a former Scientologist who had, um, I think he'd gotten up to like OT5. And um, and he had come from Denmark with the the film crew. And it was the intention was that I would show him the different things that um, were there at the property. And and whatever questions he had about that, that's what we would uh, we would go over. And and if anybody came out um, he was going to ask them some questions that he had had. It was never the intention that I would be involved in any of uh, the interactions or any of that stuff. That's that's sort of what we worked out beforehand. Now, Mark, two things that stand out to me in your book, Blown for Good. On the inside front cover, what really got my interest when you first published the book is you have a map of a gold base and it has 56 different locations. Yeah. Uh, just for our listeners who are not familiar with Gold Base, how big is the base? I think the base is about, it's five, I think it's 540 plus acres. So it's a pretty large facility and they do have property that is outside of the fence. So the fenced in property might be a little bit smaller than that, but the total amount of, of land that is owned by Scientology or by building building management services or whoever owns that property it's it's about 540 acres the second thing that people should know is that uh, gilman hot springs road highway 79 runs right through the middle of the base that's correct it it the entire property is cut in half by the highway so you have you have half you have the north side and you have the south side and the staff in the early days they had to cross the highway to get from one side to the other and that is your main uh that's where your main loss of of escapees is is when when they get into the highway they're sort of that's their chance to you know go down the highway instead of to the other side of the property so they put tunnels at least two tunnels under the highway that now if you go from the north side to the south side or vice versa you just go under the highway it's not a uh, an optimum escape route anymore <laughs> unless unless you have some sort of vehicle that you're you know pretending to drive to the other side of the property with then you you can't go through the tunnels the tunnels are pedestrian only tunnels i think you could go through there with a golf cart or these electric carts that they have there now. But uh, if you've got a, a full-size vehicle, you gotta, you got to cross on the highway. Now, to set the stage, today is December 10, 2014. Now, in this period, Southern California has experienced record rainfall. And this set the stage for a massive mudslide at the base. Were you scheduled with the Danish TV crew before the weather set in? Oh, absolutely. This was, this was scheduled... Uh, at least weeks or months ago before um, it was determined which days we would be going there. And so they had a flash flood that occurred there, I want to say early, early th the last week on Thursday. And on December 4th. That's right. And, and Gilman Springs Road was actually closed between State Street and Sanderson, um, which is the entire length of the Gilman Springs uh, the int base property. So if it's closed from those intersections, there's no access to the base at all, period. And we saw that mud. When we went there, there were some sections of the highway where you can see that the mud was several feet high. And I saw pictures uh, the, the same day of the, the flash flood. And there, there were vehicles that were nearly complete, 
completely buried by the, the mud that had come down from the mountain. And I was surprised. I watched it on the local news, and it was just a torrent of fast-moving mud, some places over six feet, which would be two meters for our European listeners. Catherine Fraser, who will become a central part of the story you're telling, was on the local news here saying it was a controlled panic. <laughs> yeah, which is really funny because in 1990, in August of 1990, there was a catastrophic flood that occurred at the property. And and I don't think it was half as bad as the flood that happened a week ago. And the entire property, all of the employees that worked at the international headquarters, the Ent base of Scientology, um, David Miscavige assigned us all confusion for essentially allowing a natural disaster to occur. <laughs> now, let me get this straight. Confusion is what's called an ethics condition. That's correct. And it's the lowest ethics condition, and you're supposed to find out where you are. Yeah. You don't even know where you're at because you allowed a natural disaster to occur. That's right. How, how does that work? <laughs> it doesn't work very well if you're <laughs> one of the staff there. <laughs> That's when – and I detail all of this in my book, Blown for Good, but essentially – it is a whole new set of penalties and restrictions, and that's pretty much where our 15-minute meal breaks, you know, that's really when that got instituted. So for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you have 15 minutes for each of those to eat. They have these things, they're called musters, which is basically where all of the staff are accounted for at least three times a day, uh, sometimes four times a day. So you have one after breakfast, one after lunch, one after dinner. And then depending on what was happening at the time, we'd also have one at the end of the night. And during and directly after the flood, we did absolutely have one at the end of the night, um, you know, around 11, uh, 1030 or 11 o'clock at night, we'd have another muster. And it's where all of the crew are accounted for. So everyone's counted up. And if anyone's missing, then we know we lost somebody. And then they need to send out the, the squads to go hunt them down. But if you were late to a muster, then you, you would have what's called all-night amends. So that night, if you were late for morning muster, so let's say you went – you ate breakfast and then you went to the bathroom and it took you, you know, 30 seconds longer than you thought it was going to be. And you showed up to, you arrived at the muster location after the designated time, then you would be assigned an amends project, which would go through the night that night. So you, you were not allowed to sleep. You had to work all that night. And then once you'd been late once, if you were late twice, so if you were late, if you were late to a muster one more time, then you would go to the, the Rehabilitation Project Force in Los Angeles. And those were the stiff two gruesomes or the stiff penalties that were put in place directly after a mudslide. So because the it, there was uh, an excess amount of water in the clouds and that was let go and rained onto the mountains and the mud traveled down to the property – these were the penalties that were enforced upon the crew that worked at the international headquarters. That's just insane. And, but that is the culture of the Sea Org. And Mark, we were talking before the show, you mentioned that uh, the Church of Scientology did not have flood insurance on that. That's right. In the 1990 flood. flood, I don't know who was responsible for it, but um, because there was damage and it was from a flood in a regular occurrence for a large company of that of that size that's based at the the bottom or the base of a, a large mountain um it would be normal or expected that you would have flood insurance and they didn't so all of the damage was they just had to suck it up there was a flood later on i can't remember when it was i think it was in the two i want to say it was in the 2000s the early 2000s and during that flood there was another there was another, uh, you know, substantial amount of damage that I think most of the staff did the repairs on, and maybe they hired some outside contractors as well. But they did have flood insurance in place for that. So in the case of that, um, they got a check. So I'm pretty sure that they would still have flood insurance in place, and they probably 
um, you know, we're able, we're, are, are making a claim to have the damage covered by the insurance. But when, so yeah, so that's sort of the setup for us going to the property. So, and I, and when I met with the the Danish crew the morning that we were going to go, I, I informed them that there had been a flood. And so they're probably the sides of the road are going to have mud on them and it'll be, you know, add a little bit of extra unplanned um, activity to our trip. Then what happened when you arrived? So when we arrived there, we parked, we parked a, a, a pretty long distance away from the main property. Um, well, well, well outside of the gates and mainly because there was huge, huge stacks of mud uh, on the sides of the road. Um, we didn't want to drive near the property and then get stuck there in the mud. So we parked in an area that it didn't have that much. And then we walked from, from that point. This, uh, this gentleman, Robert and myself, um, the, the gentleman, Robert Dam from, from Denmark, uh, we walked along the highway and the camera crew just basically followed behind us as I gave Robert a tour of the base properties. And the first thing I noticed was that there was a large area of the uh, uh, very far north side of the property where there was a building called OGH, the old Gilman house. So it was where the, the gentleman who basically started the hot springs many, many decades ago, it was his house. So it was called the old Gilman house. That's where when I first got there in 1990, there wasn't a lot of um, staff housing on the property and old Gilman houses were the, mainly the security um, guards lived and people that were thinking of leaving or had tried to leave or who had left and got recovered, that's where they slept. They kind of lived with the security guard. I think simply due to the fact that it was just more efficient for the security guards to just sleep where they always sleep. And then the people that are trying to escape just sleep with them. <laughs> so yes, I, I actually myself spent a few, few nights in OGH throughout the years, but um, that entire area, there was another little building ne near that called the, the maintenance man house. And then a few little other outbuildings that entire area was bulldozed. It was just dirt. There was nothing there. There was there was a greenhouse that used to be there. There was the old Gilman house, maintenance man's house. All that was just dirt. There was just nothing. So that was a that was a pretty big surprise. So they basically erased that whole area of the property. Mark, that's interesting because to to, to me as a critic, uh, old Gilman house. Uh, as I've heard it reported, it's notorious as a place for the RPF, lock people up in OGH, Old Gilman House. And just as the church got rid of the running circle after aerial photographs were produced, yeah. it is possible that they're, they're going to repurpose the land, but they want to get rid of uh, evidence of the RPF. Yeah, I mean, so, there was no, I mean, when I arrived there in 1990, the old Gilman house was a death trap. So there was no good reason to keep it. It was, you know, it was very, even they had renovated it once or twice during the time that I was there. And even that it was just, you know, putting in new carpet and, you know, putting, you know, new, new uh, coat of paint on the walls and doors and stuff like that. But I'm sure that the, the only a uh, permittable thing to do <laughs> would be to drive a, a bulldozer through that place without having to spend millions and millions of dollars to, you know, get it up to code. And So the old Gilman house is gone and then you and Robert Dam proceed on? Yeah. So we, we continue to walk on. Um, we, I showed them, you know, basically every so many f sections of fence, there's a little fence shaker and I showed them all the floodlights and the barbed wire and the, and the, um, you know, there's on the walls where there's no fence, they have these walls and there's a little, a little sensor wire that's, you know, about four or five inches off the wall. And if you trip that, that sets off the alarms. And I just showed them all that stuff. I showed them all of the cameras. There's just cameras here, there and everywhere. I showed them the, the special system that they have to capture license plates that drive by and these spotlights that they have and these cameras that are focused right in the rear of vehicles. So when, you know, people yell as they're driving through the property, they can catch them at any one of the gates where these license plate cameras are. And, and then I showed them where the hole was. 
So that was definitely a question of Robert's, like, where's this hole building? And I showed him where the hole was and explained to them that uh, David Miscavige had a piece of wood engraved that had a quote from some policy letter where it says, you know, man has dug himself into a hole and only Scientology can help them dig their way out. And that actual L. Ron Hubbard quote was engraved in a piece of wood that was hanging on the outside of the whole building. So that's actually how the whole got its name. I, I, th that's the folklore. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming because that's the only thing that would make sense. It might have been, you know, Dave Miscavige might have thought that up afterwards, but regardless, he had a piece of wood engraved that said that on it, and it said the hole, and that place was called the hole. So, you know, makes sense to me. So despite what the church is saying, that the double wide trailers called the hole are still there. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. The building's there. There's no question about that. But, um, I mean, we saw it. It's there. It's still there. The, they, I'm sure that, from what I could tell, it didn't look like there were bars on the windows, um, unless they moved the bars on the inside. But um, <laughs> there wasn't any bars on the outside that I could see from the highway. Oh, and, and mind you, we're, we're looking at all this from the highway. So we're not inside the property per se. We're just walking along the side of the highway, pointing these these different buildings out. Mark, how damaged did the property look from the mudslide? I didn't see any significant damage down by the what's called the Cine Castle, which is more on the, the west side of the property. There was definitely mud that had come across, and it looked like it had just, if anything, had covered up some landscaping or maybe some sprinkler heads. But other than that, it didn't seem like too much. As we made our way up towards the center of the property, I saw an individual drive up in a van and he had a camera in his hand and he was running into the uh, Golden Era Productions administrative building. And the guy that was carrying the camera was one of my best buddies when I used to work there, a guy by the name of Kevin McHenry. And I said, hey, Kevin, hey, when are you guys coming out here? <laughs> And um, and so he ran into the the administrative building, and then I told so then I told the Danish guy I said okay so they know we're here and they're working something out because he just ran inside with the camera and I've seen him specifically him come out in the past when people had been there and with the camera and the whole drill so at that point we knew something was possibly going to happen. Now, Mark, let me interject. Yeah. Robert Dam has been very well known to Scientology critics for a long time, and uh, he, he, you know, he's been working to expose the church for a long time. His website for listeners who want to follow this is Robert Dam D A M dash C O S dot D K. So they know you, the church knows you, and the church knows Robert Dam. Yeah, and he wrote a book. Um, I think it was published. I want to say it was in 2011. Correct. On his experiences in Scientology and and he he got out and his wife got out and I he has two daughters as well that 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 used to go to Scientology schools and so on and they left with him so he, he was lucky enough to have his whole family leave when he himself decided that he was going no longer gonna you know be a member of Scientology Oh, indeed, very fortunate to have his family leave. Uh, so you and Robert are proceeding that the church yeah. knows you're, knows so, you're uh, walking down the road. Yeah, at this point, we know that – I know that it's known that we're there because I see him run in with the camera, and he runs into the building. Okay, so we make our way toward the other end of the property. So we're now near what's called the villas, which are the RTC build buildings where David Miscavige lives, where his personal quarters are. And they've erected a huge uh, wall between the highway and these villas um, so that you can't see the villas at all from the highway. You can barely see the roof on one of the villas from the highway. But other than that, the sound and the and all visibility is blocked from the highway of the RTC villas. Um, then we pointed out the the film lab, the birthing buildings, the, the staff housing, and David Miscavige's RTC building, Building 50, uh, which it's commonly referred to at the end base. And then we got to where the G units are. 
and the G units are these like luxury bungalows and that's where Tom Cruise stayed when he came in the early 90s to the international headquarters amp base he stayed at the G's and he was set to come in the late summer of 1990 and the flood of August 1990 happened right before he was coming so that's why it's so it's such a vivid memory is because the flood happened and it was right before Tom was coming and all the 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 G units were flooded with mud and they had to be redone and it was a huge flap and we were underneath the G units in the crawl space literally in sitting in soaking mud with shop vacs sucking the mud and then emptying the shop vacs and sucking the mud and it just went all night every night and we couldn't be late for musters and it was it was a wow it was a, it was a, it was a whole nightmare so when we got wow. down to where the g's were the fence that's right out right above where the g units are was gone there was no fence there so there was just a huge section of the property where there was no fence and you could see that the mud it looked like the mud had just gone straight through that whole section and they had two really uh, heavy duty bulldozers there that were moving you know massive amounts of mud on the north side of the highway and then moving mud on on the south side of the highway where the g's were and they were driving in and out of that section where there was no fence and then right after that empty fence section is the, was the was the G units was the actual uh, the the vehicle gate that leads into the property right where the G units are, and when we were walking up near the gate, we could hear somebody talking to us through the actual squawk box, the little speaker box inside of the gate um, structure, and the best part of this is that before we went up to the to the ant base earlier in the day the danish crew interviewed me and said what can we expect to have happen when we go up there to the base and i kind of listed out several different scenarios and and what things they might say and what things they might do and one of the things i said is i said you know they might bring up they they love bringing up this this thing about oh i sold some equipment when i worked there and i got all this money for it and i was selling stuff on ebay and and this absolutely did happen and i did get approval to do it and i detail this all in my book very clearly and i said when i first was there and they were getting all persnickety about this money through ebay they were accusing me of of taking 250 dollars that's what they were saying i embezzled $250. And, and I said, that's what they said when I was there. After I left, the figure in my uh, suppressive person declare, it went up to $750. So the reason I was being expelled from Scientology after 15 years and all this other stuff was because I had taken $750. And then I explained to them, over the years, Tommy Davis said it was a few thousand dollars, and then it was $4,000. And, and I said, I think the last time it was, you know, thirteen or $15,000. <laughs> and so I told them that they might say this. And I, and uh, so when we got up to the, the gate, we hear this voice, and, and it was Kevin Catano, who is the security chief. And I recognized his voice immediately. And he said, hey, Mark. Did you tell him about that money you took? <laughs> and the Danish guys, they lit up. <laughs> they lit up like Christmas trees. Like, oh my God, that's what you said they would say. <laughs> and it was like, it was almost like I had told the Danish crew this is what's going to happen. And then I sent it to the, to the Scientology people. And then they just read it. They literally read off what I said they would say like a script. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, Anyway, so they said it, and then I said, did you hear what they said? And they said, yeah, they are asking about that money. And I said, yeah, is that crazy, right? Anyway, and then they had these construction workers there that were operating the bulldozers, and they were just kind of hanging out with us while we were talking at the gate. And they were – they it looked like they were being entertained. So 
and and you know it's a film crew and you know lots of people like when when people are filming stuff they like to see what's going on so the construction guys were just hanging out there at their truck and i was like hey yeah this is where tom cruise came and i was trying to be entertaining for the construction guys and and i was kind of talking into the squawk box but i couldn't get any action that this the gold the scientology people would have none of it they, they didn't want to have any other um, dialogue through the squawk box. So it's like, okay, well, whatever. So then we start making our way back to the vehicle. So we're, now we're all the way at the end of the property on the east end, and we're going to walk all the way back to the other end. And I would say this took us about maybe an hour, give or take, a little bit plus or minus, you know, five, ten minutes to get all the way to this side. And Sure. So you, you, had, you had originally parked on the east side and moved west? That's correct. And now you're turning around to go uh, from west back to east. That's exactly correct. And, 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 and the entire time we were on the south side of the highway. So right, right, just right next to the fence, pretty much all the way along the highway. So we walk back. And as we walk back to the main guard booth, Catherine Frazier, Kevin McHenry, and a security guard by the name of Jurgen Larson are waiting there for us. And I said, oh, okay, here we go. They're waiting for us. So I kind of just hung back. And then Robert and the Danish film crew walked towards them. And Robert started to ask, oh, I have a question for you. My name is Robert. And Catherine just walked right around him, right around the Danish crew and came straight up to me and started saying, you know, and I and I immediately I said, oh no no, I'm not here to talk to you. Robert's got questions that he's trying to get answered. I'm I'm just you know, I'm, this this is not about me. And she's like, oh no, we wanted to give you a message. And that's when the the shouting started. Oh, you were never a high position, which was another one of the things that I told the Danish crew that she might say. <laughs> And then, oh, you did this, and what about the money? And and so she just started saying it over and over again. And I was like, oh, you want to see some pictures? You know, I was I was trying to keep it light, and you know, and she's like, oh, you didn't have a high position. I was like, well, I was the producer. I mean, that's probably the highest position I had. It, she wouldn't engage in a conversation. She just wanted to yell, 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 yell. So then Robert tried to talk to her, and then she didn't want any of that. And so then. They basically kind of just videoed us. Kevin McHenry had a video camera, and then Jurgen had a little handy cam, and he had like a little uh, parabolic microphone, like one of these. It looks like a uh, like a bowl that's surrounding a microphone, so it it gives a very directed micro. It picks up the sound in a very pinpointed spot. And he had one of these little handheld units that he was pointing at me to get you know all the dialogue that was occurring. And um, and we played a little game where I would kind of – I would sit behind Robert. I would stand behind Robert, and Jurgen was on the other side of Robert. So as I moved in one left to right, then Jurgen would move left to right to be able to see me. So I just kept moving back and forth, and then Jurgen just kept moving. And it was it was just silliness. And I was laughing, and Robert was laughing, and it was it was just funny. And then Catherine but, just it, – it was obvious that whatever she had come out to do was not be, being achieved. So she just went right back in. And then um, that was it. So we thought, okay, the Danish crew were very specific. They did not want to be disrespectful. They did not want to be confrontational. They didn't want to be disrespectful in any shape or form and that the Scientology – staff were yelling and screaming and 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 you know acting in this aggressive fashion they wanted to make sure it was not because of anything that they had done so at this point we were very satisfied that we had been respectful we had been um, cordial we just were walking along the property pointing out different buildings um they engaged me at the gate okay fine i i talked back but then they didn't talk back again so we were we were good and so then as the, as Catherine and Jurgen and Kevin McHenry walked inside the property, I said, okay, see you later, guys. See you later, Kevin. And I said, I'm just going to walk off into the sunset. And it just happened that the sun had been setting in the background, so I walked off into the sunset, and that's what they filmed. And that was it. They we, the, the crew, it got a little darker. The crew caught up to me, and they were like, okay, cool. We're done. We're good. And uh, okay, let's walk back to the vehicles. That was it. It was done. The whole day was done. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing, there was no more shooting. It was just like, okay, we're just going to walk back to the vehicles 
and um, we're good to go. We got what we came for, and it's you know we could only hope for the best, and that was okay. So we're good. This sounds like it should be the end of things, but yeah, can you tell our listeners who who are not familiar? Catherine Frazier, who is she? What's her rank? What does she do? Why is she so important to the story? Well, Catherine Frazier is a the public relations person for Golden Era. Her actually po- her actual post title when I was there was port captain. It's a, it's called the Sea Organization. So the person who's in charge of public relations is the port captain as if you were on a ship and there needed to be some sort of interaction with the port that you were in. That's the person that would deal with that. So she is the port captain Golden Era Productions and sh- and pretty much the entire time I was there she was in trouble for silly things like this happening on the highway or something that needed to happen with the community and she was in charge of that and it wasn't going the way we wanted and we need to get the road closed or this or she was the person responsible with interfacing with the local community and the local governments and city and fire and police and all that but she's also she made an appearance on anderson cooper cnn that's exactly correct she in addition to being the public relations officer for Golden Era Productions, she is the former wife of Jeff Hawkins, who was a very longtime Sea Org member who also worked at the international headquarters and, and was pretty much responsible for, you know, several decades worth of Scientology promotional and marketing campaigns and uh, Scientology and Dianetics uh, campaigns that were run all the way back to, I think, the the late 70s and 80s, all the way up until the 2000s. Catherine Fraser is a high visibility Sea Org member. That's correct. So it so for listeners who are not familiar, this is a very important person who appears to be acting at the directors of David Miscavige. Yeah, she's essentially the she is the public relations staff member for the international headquarters of Scientology. That that it, it, no matter how you shake it. That's her job. If when there was a when there was a flood the week before at that property, she was the person they send out onto the highway to go talk to the news people. So, so she just talked to you. Now she goes back onto the base, and you guys go off into the sunset. It's a wrap. But then what happens? Well, in order for Catherine to leave the property and confront a declared suppressive person. That's not a decision that gets made by Catherine Frazier. That's a decision that gets made uh, uh, not even within Golden Era Productions. That's a decision that gets made in Religious Technology Center and probably, most likely, a decision that gets made by David Miscavige himself, which is the chairman of the board, Religious Technology Center, the ultimate uh, leader of Scientology. So obviously... Somebody near or with David Miscavige or David Miscavige himself had directed her to go out and do her little shout burst or, you know, statement burst at me. And from my view, it was comical. And and I was, you know, while entertained, I, you know, I, <laughs> I wasn't wiping my eyes or, you know, wishing that I hadn't left 10 years ago. I was laughing and it was, you know, we were, we were, we thought it was hilarious. It was sort of like, wow, is that was, you know, I've seen it on YouTube. I've seen it happen on YouTube, but it's never, not that I can remember, it's never happened to me where they're just all yelling like that. And it was, com- it was, like I said, it was comical. So I assume what had happened is that she had gone back inside and someone had reviewed the footage, whether it was David Miscavige or not, who knows. But I can only assume that it was was unacceptable what had happened in terms of what she did. Because by the time we get all the way back down to the vehicles, it's now it's dark. So we, we have now been there for probably two or so hours we didn't want to go in the middle of the day because that's the hottest time when the sun is directly above and we wanted you know the lighting is better when it's it's a little bit more towards the horizon and so we had gotten what we came there to get that's at least what the danish crew that was their take we got what we came here for and it's great we we couldn't have asked for anything more 
So as we are packing up all the gear and pretty much everything's done, everything's packed back up, the cameras and the sound gear and, you know, all that stuff. And we're literally getting into the vehicles and some of the crew have already gotten into their vehicles. And at this point, vehicles are coming and parking and on the highway, on Highway 79 or Gilman Springs Road, the traffic at this time is pretty heavy. So pretty much every five seconds, a car is driving by in both directions on this highway, which is not lit and it's dark and there's not a lot of shoulder because of all the mud piles. So we're right, you know, we're probably two or three feet, the car, the edge of the car from the, the road itself. So we're packing up and all these cars start showing up and I look and I see a whole bunch of people coming towards us. And I tell the Danish crew, I said, hey, guys, we got company. And they're sort of like, huh? What are you talking about? And as soon as they see all these people, they're like, oh, man. So they're getting all the, cr- the cameras out and everything. And as soon as they get the cameras out, seven people show up. And they start yelling. And, and it's so chaotic that it was hard to understand what they were saying because they were all saying stuff at the same time. And and the first thing I thought of is this is a Danish program. So they have to subtitle this. So if you have <laughs> seven people talking at the same time, it is impossible to subtitle. It would just be a wall of subtitles on the screen. So I decide that I'm going to simply introduce everybody. So as they're doing their thing, I'm like, okay, this is Eve Laws. This is Paul Sarkany. This is Jurgen Larson. This is Kevin McHenry. This is Amber O'Sullivan, which, by the way, is Claire's cousin, my wife's cousin. Um, and then I say, and this is John Stumpy. And as soon as I say this is John Stumpy, this Robert guy, he he's like, what? You're John? Oh, you're John Stumpy? This, out of all of the people they sent down, they send down John Stumkey, who, who I really, I mean, I knew him. I was there for 15 years, and he was there pretty much the entire time I was there. I knew him. We weren't like best buddies or anything. I mean, I may have worked with him here and there throughout the years, but, I mean, whatever. He was just like another guy at, at the property. But to Robert, Robert had gone to Clearwater And he was being interrogated by two staff in RTC, and one of these staff was John Stumpke, who at the time was an RTC Master at Arms, or MAA, in Clearwater. The fact that this John Stumpke guy was also written about in my book, because he's one of the individuals who is involved in this incident when he was also a staff member in RTC, where he chases us around on these motorcycles and we're sort of like supposed to like march or run at night in front of these motors by the light of the headlights of the motorcycle. And so he was this, so I had had this experience with him then, and I had written about it in my book. And this Robert guy had had an experience with him and had also written about him in his book. At this point, it's it's the Danish crew are losing their minds because they had also interviewed Robert and he had also talked about John Stumpke. And now they're, they're yelling and they're screaming. And after I introduce them, I'm showing them pictures of the kids. I'm like, oh, this is perfect because now I have – Now I don't have the public relations person. Now I have actual staff. So I don't, I know, I know Catherine, Catherine went on, you know, Anderson Cooper with the other inch wives. And so I'm not, I mean, I'm, maybe she would be affected by seeing pictures of the kids, but I'm, I'm thinking she. He's probably on a higher dosage of Kool-Aid than these other six people. So I start showing all of them pictures of my my boys and my wife. And, oh, look, this is me and my wife at this party a few weeks ago, which just happened to be this birthday party of, like, a ton of people that used to work at the Ant Base. And I'm just showing them all this stuff, and they're yelling and screaming. And the Danish crew are really trying to get a conversation going with the, with these guys and they're yelling and screaming and at one point this John Stumpy guy is yelling so loud one of the danish crew goes hey 
we're right here. You you can you don't have to yell. Why are you yelling? And John Stumkey, and this this was very comical. He in a yelling, super loud voice says, "I'm not yelling. I just have a loud voice." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and then somebody pipes in. He does have a loud voice, and then. I'm telling them, hey, guys, you guys could be so happy. Oh, my God, you would love it. I'm like, oh, yeah. there's this thing in the outside world. Oh, my God, it's the best thing ever. Um, it's called sleep. Oh, my God, you would love it. And eating. <laughs> you can eat whatever you want. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to kind of, to, oh, you can have a family and you can, you know, you can go out to eat. You can not go out to eat. You can eat five hours. You can eat one hour. You can eat five minutes. It's like, you know, I'm just trying to tell them, like, you guys could be – you would be rock stars if you left this place. You wouldn't be miserable. And at this point, I would say, oh, you would be so happy. And they're yelling, we are happy. We are happy. <laughs> they're like yelling angrily that they're happy at us. And um, yeah. And anyway, so this goes on for a few minutes. And once the Danish crew sort of engaged them, then I kind of just went off on the side, and that's when I – you know, I was just going around to the different crew like, dude, hey, Paul, there's this guy, Paul Sarkany, who we all knew as Shark. And um, I was like, dude, Paul, Shark, dude, what's up? And I was like, dude, I missed you, man. You're so awesome. I was like, dude, come on, man. Just get in the car with me. We can get out of here, dude. Come on, man. This is awesome. And I was sort of going around to all the different guys and trying to engage and have a conversation with them. And while the Danish crew had engaged Catherine and a few of the other people, and then Catherine started yelling again, and they, no, we just wanted to give a message to Mark. And I think some of that's in the videos that I ended up, at one point, I was just kind of standing there. So I was like, you know what, I should be videoing this, because otherwise, I'm not going to have this, because, you know, no one else is videoing except for the Danish crew and the gold guys, and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get any footage from the gold guys. So, so that's when I whipped out my phone and I got a few little, you know, one minute or 30 second segments or whatever. But when, when I had what, the last video that I was getting, there's a, pol there's a, like, a, I think he's a share, a Riverside Sheriff's deputy who had kind of just showed up and walked up and no one had noticed him at all. He, he just, because there was so much traffic on the highway and all this screaming and yelling and lights and cameras. And it looked like someone was having a camera war on the side of a highway in the middle of the night. And they were all yelling at each other. It was the most bizarre scene that you'd ever seen. So this, I guess this sheriff's deputy is dark. So I don't, I couldn't tell what, was he San Jacinto, Hemet, Riverside, CHP? I don't know what he was, but he looked like a sheriff. He walks up and he's basically like, hey, what the hell's going on? And then he kind of is like trying to settle it down. And then Catherine pipes up again. And then that's it. It was like, no, hey, you know, that's enough. Golden era guys, you go this way. And you guys, you know, carry on with whatever you're doing. And at that point, they all shut up. And they all scuttled off of the cars and drove off. It was like as soon as the cops came, he was literally like their kryptonite. As soon as, soon as he showed up, they stopped yelling. They stopped. And it's just like, oops, we're busted. We're out of here. And they just and that's it. And they scuttled off. And that was pretty much it. And we sat there and we probably videoed for another 15, 20 minutes on the side of the road. And it was sort of just like a recap of like, wow, we had talked earlier that certain things could happen and the, all those things sort of happened. And, and then we went over this insane coincidence of the John Stumpke aspect of things, which, which I could, I, to me, it was almost, it was like kismet. How could John Stumpke, who I, I, you know, I had a very little interaction with, except for that one thing, which I just happened to write about in my book, and have this a similar thing with this guy from Denmark from 20 years ago, and they send him to the highway. It was was just one of those things, and John Stumpke had no idea who this Robert guy was. Yeah, of all people, Mark, and you know, I, there is a certain surreality. I, I tell people, journalists who ask, you have to understand that Scientology is surreal, and surreal events can attend it so that John Stumkey shows up of all people, right? Yeah. And I gotta tell you, Mark, 
Okay, I appreciate you telling us what happened there, you know, at the actual event. I think what was shocking, I get up the next morning, right? Karen and I are here having coffee. I get on my computer and I, I said to Karen, oh my God, they're at it again. The church is at it again. What the hell are they doing? Because to, to us, it looks insane. Yeah. It's like, and the first thing I thought of, Mark, when I saw your videos that you shot with your camera is they just harassed Marty Rathbun at LAX. Now they're up to it again. Don't they have any self-control? Don't they realize what they look like? It was shocking to see. Yeah, it, I mean, it. I saw the video at LAX with Marty, and I thought to myself, they, they might have been told to go confront Marty, and I told and I told people, but they didn't tell them. Dave didn't tell them. Um, oh, go confront Marty, but if he pulls out a camera, just walk away. So then they just recorded him. And even though he was videoing them, they just stayed there. When they did it at the highway the other night, I realized they really don't care if we film them or not. It has no effect on anything they did. And I thought to myself, they're videoing it. So they had two handheld cameras, like over the shoulder, you know, production HD cameras. And then right. the Jurgen security guard guy, Jurgen Larson, had like a little, uh, you know, like a little handy cam, like a Sony or a Canon handy cam with his little parabolic mic. And I thought to myself, that parabolic mic is pretty much useless for something like this because the only thing they could capture was whoever he was pointing that mic at. And that's what made me think. This isn't, they don't care who else sees this. They want to video this and they're going to hack it up and whichever way makes them look the best. And I genuinely think they're going to show it to the crew that are still at the end base as an example of what people look like or what they do or how crazy they are, or how desperate they are, or whatever, however they want to spin it. Like, don't leave, otherwise you'll end up like this. And that makes the most sense to me because if Catherine had come out and I was like, boo-hoo, I so wish I was here again, then it would be like, okay, we, you know, success. But because I was sort of like, hey, Catherine, way to go. That was pretty lame. And I'm just laughing and, you know, it's just, it's just insanity then it was 100% useless to them because you can't show that to the crew. And they're like, oh, yeah, I got a family and I got companies and I got a house and I, you know, shed in and out twice this week. And, you know, like that's not a good video to show the crew as a reason not to escape. So that's really – that that's the only scenario – that makes any of this make sense. And I know that's sort of like the the one thing you don't try to do is make sense of anything that Scientology does. But to me, that seems like if I was still there, that's the only plausible reason why you would yell at somebody in the middle of the night on the side of a highway, the silliest things you can think of, and be happy about it at the same time. So no, it seems Mark. It seems plausible to me because uh, Marty Rath and Mark Headley, you're both extremely high-profile former uh, Sea Org members. Yeah, and they've done the same. Yeah. They, they've done this before. This is not a new thing. They did the same thing to Mike Rinder at least on one or two occasions down in Clearwater, and they brought his brother. I want to say it was his brother and his wife and his maybe his brother, wife, and daughter. I can't remember exactly who it was, but they did a very similar thing with him at a, like a doctor's office or something down in Florida. Yeah, that was with Jim Lynch where they tried to say that he abandoned them. Yeah, so, they, so they've done this before and there's some reason that they do it. And I just think because the footage has never gone public, obviously they're not using it. They're not using it for their websites. They're not using it. They're not using it for anything that's outward facing. But when we were there, when I was there for 15 years, 
we would often see media about Scientology and it had been heavily edited. So the first part of the segment could say Scientology, you know, home of the biggest movie stars in the world. And then the next scene could be often, you know, filled with controversy because they believe in space aliens. Well, they cut it as soon as it says Scientology, home of many mu uh, movie stars. That's when it cuts, and then they cut to the next clip that might have a, a you know a ten second sound bite that's good, and then they string those together, and then you're just when you're there, you think, oh man, the Scientology is the bomb. They're just talking about it on. They're talking about it on E. They're talking about it on the TV. They're talking about it on Entertainment Tonight, and oh my God, Tom Cruise is the biggest movie star in the world, and he's totally awesome. They 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 have this little you know PR spin machine that makes the internal staff they really do think <laughs> that they are the bomb and i and that is one of the things that i told them when they were leaving was like you guys are part of the fastest shrinking cult in the world not that cuz they were oh we're the we're the fastest growing religion i was like no no you're the fastest shrinking cult in the world and they were like what no uh uh you know but that's the only thing I can think of that it would make sense. And, and even that is a stretch because <laughs> the last thing you want to do is show somebody who was there who's left. I mean, I don't know how any of the stuff they shot with me. I mean, I'm pretty much laughing <laughs> the entire time. So I don't know how they could shoot that or, or edit that to show somebody that wouldn't just be like, he pretty much looks like he's laughing at you guys. You know, like, that was not a good show. Well, they could. Do you know, if it didn't come out the way they wanted, they would hire some actor to play you. Well, no, and, no, uh... no. people know what I look like. <laughs> and that's, that's the no, craziest kidding. thing about all this, is that most of the people that were there at the base, they know me. And I'm just sort of... I'm pretty sure you could ask most of the people that know me now and that were at the in base when I was there at the same time, I'm pretty much the same guy. I'm not, you know, I didn't go through some, uh, you know, massive transformation after I left. I'm, I'm pretty much the same guy I was when I was there, and I act the same, and I talk the same, and, you know, mo mo I'm not as skinny. I, I mean, I will admit that. I'll be the first to admit I... I do uh, eat a little bit more than I ate when I was working there, and I probably, you know, exercise a little less and sleep a little more. And but I'm pretty the personality and you know my general demeanor is pretty much the same. So when they see me, they can see, oh, it's the same dude who was here before. You know, I'm I'm, and and that's like and that's a, the other thing, John Stumkey. When I saw him, he's the same dude he was when I was there too. He's a bit of a dick, <laughs> so it's like okay, it's he's the same guy. He hasn't changed either. To me, it was it was a home run. It was a grand slam. It was a touch. It was it couldn't have gone more. Uh, it couldn't have gone better if we wanted it to. There's there's nothing we could have asked for more than what we got in terms of documenting the insanity that is Scientology. Well said, Mark. And a question for you. What do you think the, the fallout or aftermath is for the Sea Org members who were involved? I don't know. It's hard to say because they're trying to – they're trying to <laughs> – this is the craziest part. They're trying to spin it that the that's wonderful there. It's like Disneyland, and they're all happy and they love it. And so then they get sent out on the highway, and you gotta wonder if they're like they go back and it's like you guys suck. You totally didn't do what I say. That's it. You know, beans and rice for the next three months. It's like you. They went out on the highway to try and sell how awesome it is there and how happy they are. And because they couldn't do that, now they're miserable. So I don't. It's I don't know. It's it's. When I was there, and I, I was telling somebody this yesterday, when I was there, that's how they treated each other. This yelling and screaming and this craziness, that's how they do – that's how they interact with each other. Dave will literally say, go down there and get him to confess his crimes, and you'll have 20 people yelling at somebody. What are your crimes? What did you do? We know you've been up to no good. What did you and and that is sort of that's sort of what goes on in the hole. 
that's like that's the that's the day to day activities of the whole is people trying to get other people to confess the shit that they've done when they might not have done anything. But Dave's got a hair and he thinks that, you know, hey, I don't like this guy and I want to know what's up with him. And you go find out you do the dirty work, you dig it out of him and then you tell me what he did. So. And you can ask, you know, Mike Rinder or, you know, any of these people that have been there and they'll tell you, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what goes on. We, you get into a meeting with Dave and, and somebody comes off and he's, you know, got up on the wrong side of the bed or whatever, and someone's going to get interrogated and it's usually going to be by him or, you know, four or five or 20 or 30 other people. And and when we left and the, and I told the Danish crew that I said yeah inside the int base inside that bubble that's normal what they were doing is not it's not weird to them that's how they treat each other so that they treat us like that is it's to me it's shocking now because you know I've been gone for this in a month it will be my 10 year anniversary from escaping from the end base so um it's definitely odd to me now but when I think back on my experiences there it some of those same people yelled at me before <laughs> You know, it's it's just so strange, Mark, that um, the church doesn't see that base crew doesn't see that this abusive conduct, this yelling, surly, angry, trying to find your crimes, that's what defines it as a cult. But when you're inside, you don't see it. You can't see it. Yeah, and and that's what I was, and, and literally that's what I was trying to explain to them when we were on the highway. I was like, you guys are in a bubble, man. You when if you got outside. And, and, and even then they're yelling me, we do live outside. What are you talking about? And you just like, you just like, you don't, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to explain. Yeah. I remember, <laughs> yeah. Catherine Fraser saying that we do live outside every day. Yeah. Well, you might go outside every day, but yeah. you're not living outside of that like, bubble. If you live and that's the craziest thing of all, if those people, if they, if that, if they were just drop shipped to, to anywhere in the United States and allowed to live in in some in just whatever town you pick and live for a month, they would they would never go back there. They would be like, oh my God, you know, this is the real world. Because they they sell this story that everyone's a criminal. There's crime on every street corner. Everyone's evil and the psychiatrists run everything and they're, they're in cahoots with the bankers and the pharmaceutical companies and they paint this picture like, oh my God, you know, you can't walk down the street with getting, without getting raped, mugged and bankrupt, you know? And then you, you go in the outside world and you're like, um, not really. I mean, in the time that I've been away from the property in 10 years, I can tell you that not one single person has treated me like any of the people at that imp base treat each other. Not one single person. I mean, obviously, yeah. obviously I've had disagreements or arguments or, you know, differences of, a, of opinion on things, but there's no one who's been yelling at me, screaming at me, who's pretty much made me think that they are out to get me, you know, there's no one like that in the real world that acts like that. So that's the sort of thing that, that they, they haven't experienced it. So it, even though they say, Oh, we're happy here. Oh, it's just part of the, it, that's the, that's the brainwashing or the conditioning or the Kool-Aid or whatever you want to call it, that if they don't have that thing to compare it to, if they did, they would never go back leap that you have to make is you have to think, oh my God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to leave. And only once you leave, do you realize, oh my God, these guys have no power over me. And, and that was the other thing that the Robert guy had said is he said that if he was still in Scientology and they had done that to him, he might've just agreed and said, you're right. I'm sorry. Da, 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 da. And, and I think I might've done the same thing if I was still there. And they did that. But because I've been gone and because I'm out of that bubble, all of these things that they do, it has zero effect on me. Like it literally, it does nothing. It's almost like they weren't even there. That ineffectual. 
now that I've lived outside of that world for so long. That's a very powerful insight. They, they, they no longer have a hold on you. Mark, I think what you did so well in your book, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, you you gave the world a, a very rare glimpse into a culture that is hard to understand, that's insular, that's difficult, that has been compared to North Korea. And uh, your book certainly was very successful for that reason. I remember on Zenu.net years ago, before you wrote your book, when you posted the story of musical chairs. Yes. It was just shocking. It was just shocking. It, it, it sent shockwaves to the critical community and through the media. And I highly recommend Blown for Good uh, to anyone by Mark Headley. Mark, it's been a pleasure having you on the radio today. I'm going to end by asking you one question you get asked a lot, but yeah. I still have to ask it. Your next book, when? When I get some time. I mean, I've, I've pretty much written it for the most part. I've got to, this is the craziest part. I've been done with this book about five times and more stuff happens. <laughs> the book is about, it picks up right when I left Scientology and Claire escaped and now we're together and now we've escaped from Scientology and we're starting our life and it documents and, and details out all of the insanity which has ensued now that we've left what they tried to do to us. And if you think what happened when we were was there was bad, now that we've left, it's even crazier. And, and what's happened is every time I pretty much think that it's over, another person calls me, another significant person in the history of Scientology contacts me. And then this leads to additional events and Unfortunately, some of these events which are unfolding, they haven't yet unfolded and they are going to occur throughout throughout 2015 and they will be monumental insanity for Scientology. So those things sort of have to happen in order for the book to come to a close. And I, I, I wrote this on Tony Ortega's blog in the comment section today, but Scientology is infatuated with rewriting the past, and my interests and intentions are to change their future. And that's what this next book is going to basically detail out and it's going to cover. Well, Mark Kelly, you certainly have everyone's attention and I very much appreciate you being here today with us on Surviving Scientology Radio. As always, we'll be in very good touch.